Today on Landline, does the science behind banning native timber logging in Victoria stack up? Well, I refute that there's been secrecy. We've been very open about this, but there has been a convergence of um, circumstances and particularly the, the legal proceedings and people being stood down for a long period of time. Innovating how water is used to grow cotton. I believe that you can go from 10 people to one in a comparison, you know, so 10% of your previous labour force. And the country women who started a rugby carnival to motivate the kids to visit home. They were all away working, but they, they loved coming home and it was a reason to come home. They loved playing rugby. Hello, I'm Pip Courtney. The recent ban on native logging in Victoria has exposed a rift among some of Australia's top scientists. Those opposed to logging say the decision will help Australia reduce greenhouse emissions, but others dispute that, saying it's at odds with world's best practice for fighting climate change. Here's Landline's Tim Lee with part two of his special investigation. The Australian forestry industry is being shaken up all over the country. Victoria has banned native logging from early 2024, though court injunctions effectively stopped it late last year. Court action to halt logging is also underway in Tasmania and New South Wales. Western Australia's industry will also end next year. The Greens and Environment Groups are now pushing for an Australia-wide ban on logging. An idea also supported by some members of the Federal Labor Party. But Victorian timber workers and towns dependent on logging are deeply worried about their future. Earlier this year, they were given six months notice logging in native forests would end, overturning an earlier state government decision to close it in 2030. Environmentalists contesting the legality of logging in central and eastern Victorian native forests won a Supreme Court injunction, halting harvesting in late 2022. Forestry Australia, the peak body representing forest scientists, farm foresters and forestry professionals, condemns the decision. It's very concerning that the future of our forests seems to be now being determined by political ideology and complex legalities um, and all these lawsuits that are coming about and challenging the way our forests are being managed. It's actually um, disempowering and undermining the forest management professionals who are trying to do good work to manage our forests effectively. The government admits the threat of costly court action was a major reason for the early end to logging. That was a, a significant element um, that brought about the decision in the end. We had to ensure that were, the industry was paid, even though it couldn't cut wood, because we needed to retain the skills and the capabilities uh, just in case things changed. But the advice, and as it has panned out, with subsequent court decisions and appeal decisions, the uncertainty is permanent. And it's a deep uncertainty for numerous rural and remote timber communities across Victoria, where alternative employment opportunities are almost non-existent. I think towns like Orbost that are, you know, really isolated from other areas are extremely hard hit. You know, the social fabric of that town has basically been torn apart. For Wellington Shire in eastern Victoria, the council says 600 jobs now hang in the balance. The impact is that uh, ash timber over in Hayfield is the biggest hardwood timber mill in Australia, employs a lot of people. So the impact on Hayfield as a community if that mill was to close would be devastating. Ash timber, like other mills, same as Yarrama, importing timber from other states to be viable and from overseas, where we lose control by getting rid of our sustainable Victorian timber industry to make sure the trees are used in the correct way. Information that was provided. 
The council has tried for four years to learn why the government decided to ban native logging initially in 2019. Eventually, under freedom of information, it received some cabinet documents. So in 2019, after a couple of years with legal action and VCAT, we finally got some information. It was a lot of blacked out information and it was told that it was in cabinet confidence and they couldn't release any more. So the documents we got did not give us any, any closure on the decision at all. The documents do reveal the state government was influenced by public opinion and negative perceptions of logging. But the agriculture minister says the government has been open and transparent. Well, I refute that there's been secrecy. We've been very open about this, but there has been a convergence of um, circumstances and particularly the, the legal proceedings and people being stood down for a long period of time that has um, brought this issue to a head. So there's nothing complex about this. It's fairly straightforward. In Hayfield, Australian Sustainable Hardwoods has invested tens of millions of dollars in equipment to enable even small offcuts to be moulded into high strength beams and feature grade flooring for high end buildings. This is very little wood, a little fibre that doesn't go into a high end valuable use that is a long term carbon store. That's the key to what we do. With no access to local hardwood, the company is now bringing logs from Tasmania and the United States. We're importing raw oak out of the United States and we're manufacturing with that in Australia. But that is expensive and um, to do, we're bringing it a long way, but it's the only way we can substitute for the wood we're now missing from Victoria. At nearby Yarram, Radial Timber Australia has also invested some $30 million in high-tech machinery and planted several thousand hectares of hardwood plantations. The company was on track to harvest only plantation timber by the 2030 deadline. Now, to replace local wood, it's currently trucking logs from Queensland as a stopgap measure until their own plantations can be harvested. Forestry Australia says the knock-on effects of the end of local logging are already sounding alarm bells about imported timber. Imports have already increased by 40%, and that's from countries like the US, China, Brazil, and Indonesia. The majority of those imports are coming from countries where the environmental index is actually lower than Australia's environmental standards. So that's something that we should really be concerned about when we think about you know, our own moral responsibility. Ecologist and forestry academic, Dr. Chris Taylor, from the Australian National University Environment School disputes those figures. Well, what we've seen with timber imports is we've seen a decline from countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, particularly in dressed uh, sawnwood. You know, this is the Australian Bureau of Agriculture, Resource, Economics and Sciences, ABES. It's their data. We've seen a decline in those imports. Dr Tyron Venn, an agricultural and natural resource economist at the University of Queensland, who has also studied forestry systems in Australia and internationally, says we need to consider the real cost of international timber. China imports, well, they get their logs uh, from places like Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Ghana, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia. They process those products and we buy it from China. We also import a lot of products from Malaysia and Indonesia. We know that plantation timbers and native forest timbers from Malaysia and timber are associated with the decline of the orangutan, Malayan tiger and other endangered species in, in Asia. He and others argue closing Australia's regulated renewable forest industry will not only worsen greenhouse emissions, but it will have dire environmental consequences here and abroad. We need to be considering the biodiversity and carbon impacts of our native forest management decisions at a global scale, not just a local or regional scale, because the economic reality of the world that we live in is that decisions made locally have ramifications internationally. But Dr Taylor sees the decision as a victory for the local environment. It's a really good decision. The government needs to be congratulated to, to taking this bold step. It was a very courageous step. 
one that was, you know, long overdue. For decades, prominent ecologist Professor David Lindemeyer and other scientists have argued timber harvesting is destructive to the environment and must end, or risk jeopardising species such as the critically endangered leadbeater's possum. Ecologist Professor David Lindenmeyer has studied leadbeater's possum habitat for three decades. He's highly critical of the logging practices in this forest. We have recommended a one kilometre buffer around every known location for this animal. And that's based on the science of understanding how big the colonies are, how much forest these animals need to forage, and the highly negative impacts of logging on this species. Other forest scientists reject that. Michelle Freeman from Forestry Australia took us to a patch of regrown forest that had been logged in the early 1990s. And you've been able to show that this is still a really good habitat for a whole range of animals? Yeah, surveys in this area have found leadbeater's possums, greater gliders. Um, there's a diversity of age classes here, so um, that provides a range of different structures and habitats for, for different species including acacia in the understory for Leadbeater's possum. Michelle Freeman believes closing native forests is at odds with world's best practice, including the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. It's internationally Countries are actually investing in strategies to better actively manage their forests, including sustainable timber harvesting and approaches like ecological thinning and boutique timber harvesting operations, because it's recognised that those things are actually a really important part of the equation in combating climate change and providing renewable resources to society that mean that we don't have to rely so heavily on things like concrete steel and other non-renewable resources. Environmental groups believe plantations can and must replace native timber. This is a big change for regional communities, particularly people who live in these regions and have been working in the industry sometimes for generations. What we need to see is a rapid move to greater utilisation of the plantation resource that is already growing here in Victoria to support families and workers in the industry and support the sawmills that wish to stay open ongoing. The state government promised more plantations when it announced the 2030 shutdown of logging four years ago. In the 2019 announcement, there was to be mass amounts of plantation timber. There is not one seedling that has been planted yet, so that promise of, of sustainable plantation timber hasn't been delivered either. Victoria's native timber industry officially ends on January 1st. The state government has allocated $200 million to workers and communities to help them adjust to life after logging. We've got a whole range of people that need to be considered during this transition period and we're about getting on with it and making sure that this is a fair transition for forestry workers here in Victoria. They'll be doing their utmost to survive. Hayfield is very, very dependent on timber. We're going to be trying to find our way, our way through this and I think we'll be successful, provided the government help us turbocharge that program. Here's something you've probably never heard of, cod hotels. They're breeding boxes which replace lost habitat for the endangered eastern freshwater cod. And researchers are thrilled the fish are checking in and using them. Coffs Harbour reporter Claudia Jambor has the story. What lies beneath this stretch of the Nimboida River could give nature a helping hand in saving an endangered native species. We're hoping that nesting boxes to help them along, to provide them with small bedrooms and we've luckily had one really good success. It was this vision of baby eastern freshwater cod in one of the boxes that's excited researchers. 
and it means that we're starting to cue in to the biological needs of this fish. So being able to supplement a key part of their habitat and know that, that that design is appropriate for its needs is a huge boost to our confidence and moving forward to develop and refine nest boxes into the future. On the surface, the nimboida and waterways of the Clarence catchment may look beautiful, but under the water, sediment from historic mining and natural disasters has smothered caves and destroyed the cod's breeding habitat. One of the most important things with this fish is the fact that it actually has quite limited breeding opportunities in the wild. That's why we're starting to see the decline of this fish over previous decades. Eastern freshwater cod was one of more than 100 species identified as in urgent need of help after the 2019 bushfires in the Clarence Valley, attracting a $300,000 federal government investment into cod conservation projects. In a bid to reduce the cod's decline, local land services has teamed up with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries to create an alternative breeding space for the species. The team tested different breeding box designs at the Grafton Fishery Centre. It's been a really interesting challenge because we've got design constraints around building these things and securing them so that they don't get washed away and not fill up with too much sediment themselves and then we've got to make them so that it works for the fish. Attracting breeding age wild cod, which are usually about five years old, to use the box was an additional challenge. The male needs to do all the cleaning up of the kitchen, get everything ready to attract his lady. Then she comes into the room and if she's happy with what he's done, uh, then the, she'll lay her eggs, he'll fertilise them, she'll move off and swan off with her life and he's left to do the heavy lifting for the next three weeks, which means tending to the little, little ones, which are eggs, that are glued to the bottom of these, the nesting box, which we got to see, which is really neat. <laughs> The final design was put to the test during breeding season last spring when 30 boxes were installed along the Nimboida River. While breeding was seen in only one out of 30 boxes, Sean Morris says it's a significant feat for a population of less than 250 mature fish. With just one breeding event in one box, we could have produced thousands of fish. And so it's a huge boost to the population. Back on the Nimboida, resident Alicia Cobain loves wetting a line along the river, but not for the precious cod. She volunteers with not-for-profit Ozfish, which works with recreational fishers to help maintain healthy rivers. Her passion for cod conservation ramped up after the 2019 bushfires damaged her nearby property. Ozfish stepped up and helped us with our riparian, and that's probably why we got so heavily involved with them, because we've thrown a lot of energy into them, volunteering, um, just through pure, pure passion. She helped to install the nesting boxes at her neighbour's property along the Nimboida last year. A lot of the habitat off the riparian, which should have ended up in the river and become habitat for the cod, wasn't there. So these boxes show that, you know, the possibility is there that it will work. The next steps researchers are hoping to take with the cod hotels will happen along another part of the Clarence catchment, here on the Arara River, where the goal is to adapt the nesting box to make it attractive for landholders to take up. But look, 300 mil diameter, both ends for 50% of them, and we've got portholes to put cameras in. This pile of logs is what Sean and Brendan are focusing their attention on next. They can just go further back in the... The pair are aiming to adapt the design of the nesting box using these hollowed out trees for two big reasons. The first, to create more permanent structures along riverbanks throughout the Clarence catchment to reduce erosion, while also providing crucial breeding habitat. Thereby, hopefully, some of these older mums and dads in the cod world become familiar with those landmarks and repeatedly nest in some areas. So that's a really neat initiative. Extending the floor. But further modifications to the nesting box itself remains a priority to produce stronger results in the wild. Look, we need to refine these nesting boxes so that we get more than that one strike out of 30. We're going to be able to lift the outcome to more like 50% or even hopefully 100%. It's hoped landholders will eventually help to install the cod hotels. 
And once we've got that design really nailed, we'll be looking to the community to try and assist us with construction and placement of these nest boxes into the wild. The eastern freshwater cod is one of four native freshwater cod species that's classified as endangered or threatened. Brendan Ebner says this research in northern New South Wales could help benefit ongoing efforts to save other endangered or threatened native cod, such as the Murray cod in the state's southwest. We're hoping that any gains we have with this species, the eastern freshwater cod, in terms of new techniques for us helping bring it back, uh, will transfer to the other species and vice versa. There you go, mate. Good, good, good. It's hoped the nesting box can build on the decades of efforts to save the eastern freshwater cod. It is an apex predator. It's just as important as a crocodile. They help to reduce things like disease, other types of threats to other fish populations. But most importantly, they help to control the entire ecological balance of a riverine system. Without that, your river is generally going to be unhealthy. And if we want healthy rivers, we need apex fish predators back in our rivers. Still to come on Landline, the Bush Rugby Carnival keeping the spirit of competition alive. Most of us, we've sort of all grown up together. If not, we've pulled in a few strays along the way, make it a real sort of family sort of team. So if one goes in, we all go in. Hi, I'm Kath Sullivan. Varroa mite continues to spread in New South Wales, detected for the first time at Kempsey on the state's mid-north coast. Three infected properties have been reported in the area. Concerningly, authorities say some hives from the Kempsey region were recently sent to the New South Wales Sunraysia, prompting fears the mite could spread further. More than 200 Varroa mite infestations have been reported in New South Wales since the initial outbreak last year but authorities say they remain confident the pest can be contained. Still in New South Wales, and people found breaching rules intended to stop the spread of fire ants from Queensland could face fines of more than $1 million. New South Wales has introduced restrictions banning the import of high-risk materials such as hay, compost and landscaping materials from within a five-kilometre radius of the fire ant outbreak, that is, unless issued with a permit. Last month, the highly invasive pest was detected just five kilometres north of the state border. We don't want anyone accidentally carrying them through because it will be devastating uh, for industry and for the community and for human health. It's people's livelihood, it's exports, it's the economy, it's also the health of people in New South Wales. So when you ask is it a serious offence, I think that uh, it is a serious offence, yes. Mango growers are warning of short-term shortages and price hikes if a proposed chemical ban goes ahead. Pesticide regulator, the APVMA, has proposed an end to the use of dimethylate as a post-harvest dip treatment for fruits with inedible skins, such as avocados and mangoes. It says it's received reports of residue levels higher than permitted on fruit ready for sale, and it's given industry two weeks to appeal the proposal. The insecticide is typically applied to prevent the spread of fruit fly, but can be toxic to humans in large doses. Industry groups have told the ABC other eradication methods will take more time and come at greater expense if the sector can't use dimethylate as a dip. The federal government hopes to reduce the spread of feral deer, releasing its first national action plan for the species. The number of deer in Australia is estimated to have jumped from around 50,000 in 1980 up to almost 2 million today. Deer cost Australian communities more than $90 million a year, causing significant environmental damage, spreading disease, wrecking fences and causing traffic accidents. The Commonwealth hasn't announced any additional funding to control the species. And finally, dozens of farmers on tractors have surrounded Victoria's parliament, rallying against plans to build new transmission lines through the state's west. The convoy of around 40 tractors made the trip to Melbourne, protesting against the proposed Western Renewables Link and VNI West transmission lines. The Victorian government says the lines are necessary to help transmit electricity between states as more renewables come online. 
but farmers say the power lines will limit their ability to farm and devalue their land. We may be few of us, but we're bloody passionate, we're united, and we will come and do what we have to do to be heard. And that's Landline News. Australia's cotton growers have reduced water use by nearly 50% in the last 20 years. But the need to save even more water is ongoing. The latest development isn't just about improving water use efficiency, it's addressing the chronic rural labour shortage. For decades, one of the most tedious jobs on a cotton property has been doing the siphons. It's a simple system using air pressure and gravity to move water from a channel, over a bank and down furrows to water cotton plants. Siphons are cheap and portable, but also a very labour intensive way to irrigate. Really been difficult for farms to get people who were prepared to go out and starting a siphon's hard work as well. It can be long hours and just intensive, going around the clock for long time frames. The starting part is the easy bit, anyone can do that, but actually having it done you know, efficiently and effectively takes a little bit of skill to manage. The rural labour shortage and water savings are pushing more growers to retire siphons and go bankless. This means removing the bank and levelling the paddock so water flows under its own momentum along the furrows. I believe that you can go from 10 people to one in a comparison, you know, so 10% of your previous labour force. So, yeah, unbelievable for labour side of it. I think it's all about the stewardship of water. So if we can, if we can show that we're doing the right thing with our water allocations and how we're applying water and how we're using water, um, I think it just, it re it'll reflect back to the whole community. At St George, six hours west of Brisbane, Scott Brimblecombe has converted 80% of his 460 hectare farm. To be perfectly honest, I don't think we'd ever get away from siphons. But yeah, we'll be going to 100% bankless as soon as we practically can. And were your staff really upset that they won't have to do siphon runs anymore? Uh, I've, got a, I've got a bloke that has been working for our family for over 40 years and he's happy to see the siphons go, to be quite honest. Going bankless has delivered significant water savings, around one and a half megalitres a hectare. It's not automated, so he's still turning water on and off at night, but it's just a few winches, not hundreds of siphons. Once we get semi-automation with the winders in and full automation, I believe that we can go over two megalitres a hectare water saving uh, for yeah, flood irrigation cotton. If we're saving two megalitres a hectare, uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that that two megalitres a hectare, I can go and apply it to another crop, so I can put in a winter crop if I choose, or I can expand my acres, I can grow more cotton for the same amount of yield. The switch has lowered Scott's pumping and diesel costs, and before converting, if he ran short of water, he was looking to buy when everyone else was. So everyone's entering the market, so that pushes Supply and demand pushes the prices up. It becomes quite expensive to secure temporary water uh, if you haven't made prior arrangements. So what sort of supply rate do you think you're going to have coming in? Uh, at the moment, we're only about 12 to 15 here. Another 15 from the dam, so we're looking at about 30. And once we get the 50 megs and we've got the application, then we can go to those 144 metre bays. And we'll have the same 50 megs running through as over in the next door. Irrigation designer Glenn Lyons pioneered bankless design around his home base of St George. It began when he took inspiration from rice paddies in the Riverina to solve a problem for a client. Oh, it's exciting, yeah. At, the time, at this time, yeah, because it's, it's uh, 20 years of work that's now coming to fruition and really, yeah, starting to get out there. And what did, in the early days, what did farmers think? Did they go, never work? Or were uh, they like, wow, that's worth watching? Mostly never work, yeah. <laughs> so they were sceptics? Yeah, but that's OK, yeah. And there was a, you know, one or two got on the boat for me and uh, allowed, yeah, me to uh, design their system for them to get it going. His design is loaded onto a USB. It's handed to the laser bucket operator. 
and GPS guided machinery does the rest. A key reason Bankless has grown in the last decade is the increased accuracy of earth moving equipment down to two centimetres. Getting the fall of the land right is critical, so water goes on and off quickly with even wetting. It's taken me a while to get this clear in my head, but this is how it works. The irrigation water comes in through this pipe and pulls in here. This is a distribution basin, and while it looks very shallow, when the water has peaked, it'll be above my knee. Then the water moves down the furrows, watering this bay. When the bay is done, the gates at the top and bottom of the next bay are opened, and the water, because Glen's design has a built-in fall, moves into the next bay, waters that one, then gates are opened and closed in the next bay, and so on. And under the siphon system, water would move at about 100 metres every hour. Under this system, it moves at 200 metres an hour. Did I get it right, Glenn? Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the system gives growers more control over water application, especially reducing overwatering, where water goes beyond the plant's roots where it can't be used. Because the crop effectively stops growing for the time that the, the water's saturated. And then, yeah, so the minimal time that you can have the water saturated, the, the better growth you'll have from your crop. The system doesn't suit every operation. It's dependent on soil type, slope and the volume of water available. But Glenn says workers on farms that have been able to convert have an improved workflow especially if it's fully automated and can be run from a mobile phone. People are a lot more comfortable with their farming operation and their future because they, they can see that they're not going to need, they're not going to have this staff issue on a continuing basis, basis and their life is going to be simpler. This harvest, I couldn't find a happier cotton grower than Darren Armstrong. We, we've had, a, I'll say, an extraordinary um, season. I call it we're a bit like we're in the Goldilocks zone here in St George. So you like seeing your golden eggs out there? Yeah, yeah, the golden eggs are starting to um, starting to accumulate and, uh, <laughs> yeah, bank manager will be very happy. To get out of siphons, Darren tried pipes through the bank, but they didn't deliver. So six years ago, he called Glen. Fields which took two days to water now take one. You, you're getting the water on and off quicker, um, and people who have done the studies have really sh shown that uh, the, key, the key to water efficiency is getting that water on and off your paddocks quicker. As a guess, I'd somewhere between 10 and 15 per cent at least water saving. Maybe, maybe up to 20%, but we're growing nearly double the amount of cotton with the same amount of water. His worst block is now one of his best. Our first crop, we couldn't believe how even it was in each bay, and every bay basically yielded the same amount of cotton as a, exactly the same amount. So what would happen if, if this was just manual, you'd come here with a winch and you, so it needs to be a staggered release. We're not quartering the flow rates by doing that, but we're concentrating the water. When new trends emerge, farmers watch to see what the big operators, like Keetar, near Moree in northern New South Wales, do. Yeah, well, we'd be probably in the top ten anyway of cotton producers in Australia. And, um, yeah, as far as a, as a farm, as one unit in one spot, it would be up in the top five. Trials of Bankless and three other systems started at one of Kitar's farms 15 years ago. So we compared siphon irrigation, Bankless channel irrigation, drip irrigation and overhead irrigators like a lateral move type of system. Doing that trial sort of gave us the, um, the confidence that maybe we can roll out this Bankless channel system across the farm and replace some of our siphon fields. Researcher Lou Gall has overseen the trials since 2013. It's oh, wow. delivered a heap of information for the industry and that's great to be able to use to say we're really working on getting better at what we do 
And we're going to keep going. How did Bankless perform? Very well. And in actual fact, the last two seasons worth of data, it's produced the best results. One area with hard to infiltrate soil had a stunning response. And that converted to yield in the first year, three to four bales a hectare. Extra? Yeah. Yeah, 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 over what we are our old best yield. So, I mean, in that, that's a standout. That's what got us positive about moving forward. Three siphon teams of eight are needed to irrigate the Moree farms. This year, the bankless area needed just one person. So the irrigator that was doing it last year could control everything on his phone, so he actually didn't have to be there at the time to do the move changes. And I think that's where things are heading. It's still a lot of little bugs to get out, but um, we believe that we can, if we can take the human error out of irrigating, we can be more efficient with our water use and, and we'll buy improving yields. What puts many growers off switching to bankless is the cost of earthworks, up to $4,000 a hectare. Kitar's poorly performing siphon fields and those due for re-levelling were done first. And we've had some pretty good jumps in that where we've increased yields by two bales a hectare. On our good siphon fields, probably not going to see that, that change, but so that's where we've started. And, and if we can increase our yields by two bales a hectare, we can probably pay for that earthworks in two years. So we're trying to do 500 hectares a year. We've got 10,000 hectares of irrigated cotton here, so it's going to take a while. I think we still need to run this for a bit longer before we're confident enough to be converting whole farms. And there'll be areas where the bankless may not suit, um, where the siphon will suit better. So I don't think we're a boots and all bankless farm going that way yet, but we're, we're going to keep working on it. 1%, 2% increments or maybe double digit increments and in savings? I think we could go over 10%, yeah. Yep. That's yeah. a great result. Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. No, that's why it's worth doing. The big upfront cost of earthworks didn't take Scott Brimblecombe long to recoup, and a land valuer estimated his property is worth more. It's starting at about seven to eight thousand dollars a hectare, and heading north of that, the uh, difference between siphons and banks. That's amazing. Yeah, no, it is. It's it's significant. Your bank manager must love that. Yeah, I think he does. <laughs> With his bankless savings, Scott Brimblecombe reckons he'll be property shopping sooner than he thought. So the idea would be to go and find another farm and secure it and apply this water efficiency to that and, um, and then just keep ramping it up from there. Absolutely. What are you going to do with all those siphons? <laughs> I don't know. Someone wants to hit me up for some siphons. We've got quite a few here to get rid of. Uh, we'll say siphon trailers and siphons, they're all going by the wayside very quickly. G'day, I'm Matt Brand. According to the ABS, Australia slaughtered nearly 5 million sheep in the first half of this year, which compared to last year is up by an extra 2 million head. That's a lot of sheep and a big reason why mutton prices have more than halved in the last 12 months. It's a bit similar to what we're seeing with the, the cows that were um, used to power that, that herd rebuild. When we look at the sheep, mark, the sheep um, sector, a lot of those ewes were held for one or two years to get an extra lamb out. And so those um, ewes are now hitting the market and it, it coming, it's coming to a point in the sheep market where have, the, the sort of question is, have we reached the, the sort of threshold of where the, the flock can go? And those um, excess animals are now hitting the market. Meanwhile, the wheels have fallen off the lamb industry, according to the Weekly Times. And indeed, prices are sliding and are tipped to get worse when the spring flush kicks into gear and dry conditions bite. Big numbers of old season lambs continue to pour into the market and abattoirs are struggling to keep up. The Country Hour was told that small numbers of lambs and sheep were actually put down at some Victorian sale yards this week because there were no buyers. The wool market remains sluggish after its mid-year break. The eastern market indicator down 13. Now, there were some green shoots at the monthly store cattle sale at Powrenna in Tasmania this week, with some lines of cattle getting $200 to $300 a head more compared to prices in July. So a positive sign there in Tassie, but the national indicators were down. The feeder steer price hasn't been this low since early 2020. 
ABS data suggests that Australia's cattle herd has moved into a liquidation phase, meaning the herd size is now getting smaller. This is based off the ratio of female cattle getting slaughtered, which last quarter rose above the magic mark of 47%. But according to Men and Livestock Australia, it might not be as clear cut as that, and a lot will depend on if the next two quarters follow this trend. To Chicago, where wheat futures retreated, it's reported that Russia is dumping record amounts of cheap wheat onto the world market. Prices remain strong in Australia, though. Wheat is at $400 a tonne in WA, and barley prices continue to lift. I'm told a number of sugar mills in Queensland are battling with a bit of a stop-start crush this year because of wet weather, and the delays could see some mills still processing after Christmas. The Aussie dollar fell to a nine-month low during the week, the Aussie sugar price sitting at $830 a tonne. And finally, here's a look at the gross value of livestock for the last financial year. The nation is producing record amounts of chicken, and its value is on the rise. Australia also produced more beef and lamb year on year, but their value declined. That is the Landline Check on prices. Keep it rural. While the World Cup fills stadiums, an outback rugby carnival has drawn teams and fans from hundreds of kilometres away to book every room in a small town in Queensland's remote northwest. The event was started by a group of mums who wanted to give their sons a competitive sporting outlet. It's grown to include a women's comp and is now Hewenden's biggest and busiest weekend. Reporter Brittany Klein joined the crowd. He's not the top most barbecue cook in Queensland, but he'd be in the top four or five. <laughs> it's early morning at the Hewenden showgrounds, and breakfast is already on the barbie. In the cattle country of Queensland's northwest, no surprise, no bacon. Instead, a variety of beef cuts are on the menu. These feeds become a game day tradition, an institution started by the women still serving it up today. They've travelled, so the one thing we did right from the start was make uh, all the players get free brickies. Yeah. And we make sure they get a good steak burger or sausage burger, whatever they want with egg, sausage, and they get a popper to popper go with it. Water. That's their fruit juice because it's easy to handle. <laughs> After more than a decade's practice, the women churn out orders like clockwork, fueling up the players for a big day of bush footy at the Hewenden Rugby Sevens. <laughs> Player rosters are a real mix of experience. I'll keep my mouth shut. The team's a combination of those who've travelled hundreds of kilometres and others like Joe Bode who work out of town but hails from just around the corner. Most of us, we've sort of all grown up together. If not, we've pulled in a few strays along the way, made it a real sort of family sort of team. So if one goes in, we all go in. The boys in blue feel privileged to wear the Prairie Dogs jersey. The local side's the only team that's been a part of the Rural Rugby Carnival since its inception in 2012. Being the reigning premiers, there's surely a bit of pressure around that as well. There is a lot of pressure, but I can assure you I don't think we're going to be very... We're not going to be all there this year, I don't think. <laughs> we'll give it a try, but not, not this year, I don't think. Make sure we're getting deep. Like, don't stand in front of your person. It's going to be full pass. So get way back. There's a home ground advantage too for the Hewenden Rams. It's just experience as a team they're lacking. Oh, look, I'm kind of confident, but kind of not. <laughs> It'll be interesting. Like, we haven't all played together before, so it might take a while to get uh, gelled together. So, But hopefully we do. When the carnival is in full flight, it's hard to picture the town of Hewenden in its natural state. Located pretty much halfway between Townsville and Mount Isa, it's home to about 1,100 people. Among them, three mothers who've long spearheaded events in the local town and surrounding country. They saw a desperate need to create an extra reason for their sons to return and get together. 
they were all away working, but they, they loved coming home and it was a reason to come home and they loved playing rugby. So how did it all start at the very beginning? Well, the Friars always seemed to invite us all up on Boxing Day and towards late evening, Upper State, a football appeared and every year we'd all just come and join and the football kept appearing and they'd play football and after about five years of this going on, we decided to do something about it. We talked to my coffee lady this morning. She's going to be there at nine in the morning for us working, for the workers and committee. The women had years experience organising events, so contacts and skills weren't an issue. What they needed was additional manpower. People who knew a little more about running a full-scale rugby competition, but there was an added bonus. And it was bringing People who were probably yeah. a bit isolated and need a bit of companionship. It was bringing them into the pub for the meeting because we were always having our meetings there. To find out who played rugby at what level was really quite... You think, no, he couldn't have played rugby at all, but it was really, really good to see the men so actively involved in it. We sort of stepped back a bit there. Those who stepped up in the first instance were their own children. Now the next generation has become an integral part of bringing the carnival to life year on year. We don't even play rugby. <laughs> so we've, you know, for us it's just the camaraderie about getting together. And when this started, you know, I was new to town and becoming part of this group, I just made such great friends. And we really just used to go to the meetings to catch up. <laughs> There's a strong streak of loyalty in the North West Queensland community. If we need help with something, they're willing to pitch in because they know that they can rely on us to support their businesses and pubs. Residents all chip in to help with setup, transforming the showgrounds to a standardised rugby sevens field. But it's not just time that's donated. The marquees on the sideline showcase just a handful of the businesses and local families who sponsor the event in some way or another. Everybody's very willing because it brings a lot of people into town and they fill up with fuel, they get an extra burger on the way out. It goes without saying local businesses benefit from the influx of visitors across the weekend, but they also play their part too. Where possible, the carnival tries to source from local suppliers and show off the very best that the region has to offer. It all starts the night before match day at the Great Western Hotel. On a regular Friday night, Rob Downey would usually serve 50 to 60 patrons. Tonight, 250 players and their supporters are keen to get celebration started. We've made the trip just to have a little bit of fun and to throw a rugby ball around, I suppose. It's good to see a small community come together and put on a big weekend. The hotel's accommodation, in fact, every room in town is booked out months in advance. Others have rough camp for the weekend. Either way, the bar's sales quadruple, opening night alone. We go from zero to 100 miles an hour within a couple of hours, so. Yeah, but we sort of know what to expect now, so it's not as, as bad as the first couple of years. We put the band and everything out in the back nowadays. We have a second bar out the back. That's where the real action happens with the Calcutta. It's a fun tradition where each team is auctioned off to the highest bidder. First, second and third all take a cut of the earnings. Some sides so confident they purchase themselves. Now, what are we doing here? 451 more before we go. 450 all done, done, done at 450. He goes 450. I tell you what, it'd be the cheapest Calcutta here. Auctioneer Cody Rogers is also president of the organising committee. Like many in the region, he wears several hats. We've been doing it for 100 years, so we should know what we're doing by now, my family, so. By trade, he's a local stock and station agent. Yeah, look after this little block here, mum and dads, and get to spend a bit of time with these girls. You're not alone. Everyone kind of has a few roles around town. How much does it take for you all to come together and put on the carnival? Yeah, it's a big effort by everybody, making sure we've got all those main positions filled, um, getting somebody to run our bar, the cleaning, um, and then, yeah, just volunteers on the day to make sure they're around. 
He and his wife also gather sponsors to ensure the carnival breaks even. They look for every opportunity, even the Ball Boys t-shirts are branded at a fair price to promote local businesses. Kick off now, 33 points to nil, we're at. Cody Rogers spends game day on the mic, calling every single match in the men's and women's competitions. The way the draw pans out, local crowds get to watch 31 games in one hit, close to eight hours of competitive and hard-hitting rugby. And like everywhere's got the camp drafts and rodeos and shows and that's fantastic they're great events to go to but having something different for the community and it um yeah, it just adds a bit of excitement a bit of live football action we all like watching it on tv so why not put it on in our own towns ask anyone who spends the day on the sideline the spectacle's just as much a draw card as getting the chance to play the family-friendly atmosphere part of the reason the event only continues to gain popularity. The introduction of the women's game revived the carnival in its early days. Of the 18 teams competing, six are made up of female players with a wait list of women wanting to take part each year. The ladies' draw is just as competitive as the men's, both attracting big crowds, particularly for the final. Didn't get the win, but that's all right. We'll go for a few drinks now and party on. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Hopefully we come back bigger and better next year. The carnival's real measure of success has been bringing sports fans in the bush together. The camaraderie is I think so. the most rewarding part of this group. It's such an amazing group of people. Somehow it, we just make this amazing carnival happen every year. We don't really know how it happens, it just happens. There's lots of laughs, lots of stories. It's just a lot of fun. From rugby to cricket, Meet Abby, a young cricket sensation and this week's Haywire winner from Kumiala in New South Wales. She travels thousands of kilometres to compete and wants to help other girls play competitive cricket in rural and regional Australia. Cricket's a big deal in my family. Everyone gets involved. Our backyard cricket games are legendary. I'm the best, no competition. Oi! I don't think so. When I first played cricket in primary school, I instantly connected to it. Eight years on, and now I'm playing for Gold Gold Cricket Club. One, two, three, go! Today is our final game of the year, and we're aiming for a win. I love batting and hitting the ball in the gaps in the field, and obviously making runs. I worked hard, played multiple grades, and now I'm being noticed by selectors. But it wasn't easy getting here. here go, when I started competing, there was no team for girls, so I had to play with the boys. It was hard. I felt excluded, and I wasn't getting the same opportunities. They didn't think I was good enough, but I am. Mum wasn't happy about it, so she decided to create a social comp to bring young girls into cricket. It started with a few girls, then grew big enough to play in leagues. That's when we finally started getting noticed by state selectors. Hey mum. Mum drives me thousands of kilometres and does so much to get me to competitions. We're heading back from Melbourne, where I just trained with the Victorian countryside team. I'm so proud. But I also know there's more work to do to help girls like me who live in the country. I'm going to go as far as I can, but most of all, I want to help other girls get here too. With a get up and go attitude like that, Abby would be an asset to any team. The Haywire competition closes soon, September the 1st. For details, go to abc.net.au.
www.ruralmedia.org.au slash haywire. Next week, we're taking you to one of the busiest cattle sale yards in the country, and it's also a tourist attraction. That's the show for this week. I'll leave you with the weekly weather update from the Bureau. Bye for now. Hello from the Bureau. Here's your weekly weather wrap for Sunday the 20th of August. Last week ended with a burst of winter across Australia's southeast, but conditions have now largely eased. It's already looking clearer through much of New South Wales, but grey and drizzly across Victoria, Tasmania and southeast South Australia. Elsewhere today, a high pressure system extends cloud free skies from coast to coast and directs dry easterly flow across northern Australia. This is producing dangerous fire weather conditions through the Northern Territory and the Kimberley, likely to persist into the new week. Over in the southwest, a weak cold front is starting to bring some showers to Western Australia's coast. That front will ramp up as it moves east across the Bight, driving gusty showers and isolated storms across the southeast on Monday and Tuesday. A few patchy showers returning to the Queensland coast as well, potentially interfering with the ongoing sugarcane harvest. Behind the front, patchy fogs and frosts return to southern Australia. But with spring in the air and overnight temperatures staying cool to cold rather than freezing, widespread or severe frosts are less of a risk this week. These upcoming milder nights will help with crop recovery through Western WA, after frosty mornings through July slowed crop growth. However, increasingly warm days will follow, with daytime temperatures more than 8 degrees above average across WA's southern districts by midweek. Warming up in the east too, with showers mostly clearing in the wake of the cold front. By Thursday, mild to warm and settled throughout most of Australia. Dry in most parts, except for western Tasmania, where westerly flow will maintain a few showers. The week ends with a similar pattern, mild and mostly dry across the northern two-thirds of the continent. A few showers in the southeast and far southwest, to be maintained over the weekend by a couple of passing fronts and troughs. That's it for this week. We'll see you again next Sunday.